Radio. This is a presentation I gave via WebEx to various people at work a while ago. It goes to about an hour. It's on quality assurance principles and troubleshooting in daily life. The audio is a bit dodgy, uh, so if you can live through that, enjoy. So I've been working at Kaspersky for about four years. Uh, began in the home software section, so supporting things like internet security and pure. Uh, and then I moved on to the enterprise support, where things got a bit more interesting. Uh, previously, I was a microbiologist in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, due to the nature of that work, it required adherence to fairly strict rules and procedures. A large part of that involved quality assurance, uh, scientific method, which I guess would make sense considering I used to be, or still, still consider myself to be a scientist, and critical thinking, which is pretty useful in any aspect of your life. Uh, these principles have been useful outside of science, my a scientific arena in my non-work life, and I've become a successful cyclist through planning, and such skills are invaluable when providing technical support in my role as a tech support engineer and we'll discuss all this sort of stuff further on. Um, so, sterile injectable farmers where I used to work, a poor product would result in worst case a dead patient. So, following quality assurance procedures is pretty important. So, what is in this little presentation for you? Uh, I hope you will get an understanding of and have acquired the ability to apply scientific methods day to day to solve problems and to achieve your goals. Uh, um, I feel it an ability to determine if what someone tells you or what you read has any basis in reality is also pretty important these days. So you'll get a general understanding of scientific method and how that can make you a better problem solver. Um, in the current climate of what's called fake news by some people, conspiracy theories and the like, rather than believe what you read or what others say, being sceptical and being able to decide what is real or correct is an important and handy skill. And if any of you are on a design thinking project, um, some of the concepts here might come in useful as you troubleshoot those issues and provide solutions. So, in work and play, things mightn't always go smoothly. Um, sometimes you may want or be required to investigate why something isn't going to plan and provide a solution to it. Uh, you may also want to know why you never break 50 minutes in a 10 kilometre run, as an example. To me, it's more hill climbing, uh, why you can't cook, or why your computer keeps crashing, things like that. In your job, you may be required to determine if why a project failed, um, why is there conflict between co-workers, possibly, or why a customer is having a problem with the operation of software you sell and support, which is like tech support and what I do these days. Uh, over the last couple of years, I've used scientific principles to improve my cycling, power output and climbing speed, install and build server operating systems consistently from scratch, and to troubleshoot our security software. Um, often the reason you can't do something is because you don't put in the effort. Uh, a study or two suggests that people need at least 10,000 hours of practice to become an expert, so doing stuff over and over again, and as you'll see through this talk, ideally following the same methods and procedures over and over again in sort of a structured way will enable you to just like develop expertise. So ideally you'd become like an expert at quality assurance and applying scientific principles to what you do in order to develop like consistent outcomes and deliver services. Um, so if you can't cook, like you'd follow a recipe and you'd cook often. So you follow like your standard procedure for cooking and doing it often means you get better at it. Uh, if you're no good at math, same thing, you practice. Uh, if you can't play an instrument, like what they say, say guitar practice is one thing I do. It's like practice, practice, practice. And over time, you get better. So using a methodical approach, as I just sort of hinted at, ensures you define a problem, you test the variables, and you record the process and results. And that can help you in a number of ways. It allows you to understand what went wrong, so that the same, same mistakes aren't made in the future. 
which is ideally what you want to do. You don't want to be troubleshooting stuff that already has a known answer and things that shouldn't have happened because some procedures weren't followed. Um, it improves the process so a consistent result is more likely, which is uh, important in, say, customer service or building, uh, say, buildings or making cars or trading food for people or, or anything that basically results in selling someone something. It improves processes so future results are better or reach quicker, which is great in, say, troubleshooting. Like quick results are a good result. Documentation of process means it can be shared with others or potentially even sold in order to provide consistency, uh, potentially planet-wide. So if you're a large company, having consistent procedures means that you present a consistent face globally. And one thing about, I guess, companies is if you can show you uh, consistent, that sort of indicates that you you got, um, what is it? Oh, I forget now. I might come back to that one. Uh, basically, following a set method is the opposite of winging it. So some people are good at libbing. Um, that can tend not to lead to consistency, and you find that most people who do ad lib will have sort of a, a set procedure they would follow. Like say comedians, they'll have a set routine in their head anyway. So when they do ad lib, but be from like a, a knowledge store I have. Um, yep. So don't ad lib. Follow your procedure, and that means you're consistent, which is what we're discussing today. Consistency by following processes, which I'll get into in the next few slides. So, in order to discuss this subject, some definitions need to be defined. So, we have five uh, things we I wanted to define here quality assurance, science, scientific principles, based on science, of course, troubleshooting, which is what we're going to mainly be talking about, and critical thinking, which is also what comes in handy with troubleshooting. Uh, put all those together, give them a shake, and you've got a great package for finding solutions to problems and for improving processes. So, so what is quality assurance? Quality assurance, or QA as uh, we like to call it, is the maintenance of a desired level of quality in a service or product by means of attention to every stage of process delivery or production. Uh, you may also have heard of quality control. That's similar to quality assurance, but quality control is a reactive process, while QA is proactive. And I'm a big fan of quality assurance because I'd rather not deal with preventable issues. You might, might see people running around going, how did this happen? Um, the only really acceptable answer to that is because you never predicted that would ever happen. Because if you could predict it would happen, then ideally you'd have set procedures in place to prevent things like that happening. Uh, for example, you don't want to have someone running around going, how did this building fall down and how does this bridge collapse? Because you'd want to have it designed properly and by people actually know what they're doing, which then results in like a quality product because you paid attention to every stage of the process, delivery and the production. Um, and I'm sure you'd like quality products rather than not be the one to discover a uh, problem with them. So you wouldn't want to find like, strange objects in your food or you wouldn't want your TV to catch fire because it's short circuited, which you could sort of extend that to the, the QC side of things because then you report it back to the company and then the QA people would jump in and examine the process and then put in places and steps so things didn't go wrong in the future. And ideally, they're already in place. So you don't drink tainted milk or drive a car that has like squirt wheels or something. Uh, so basically, everything is fit for purpose. Our next definition is science. So, Wikipedia defines define science as a systematic enterprise that builds and organises knowledge in the form of testable explanations and predictions about the universe. So much of modern life arises from a history of scientific endeavour and without science we might still be trying to develop planes of fluffy wings and through following like, set procedures and testing and documenting what people discovered they found that fluffy wings weren't the best solution to flight. It was uh, discovered that solid wings worked because people then tested out physics and discovered that as the wing of certain shape moves through the air, there's less air pressure than anything holding up planes is air pressure, which is 
pretty amazing when you think about it, especially when you're in a plane going, hmm, air pressure, that's holding me up. Okay, that's, that's good to know. So, scientific principles, which follow from science. So, scientific principles utilise science in order to test hypotheses and assumes verified theories remain valid. So, in science, and really, it should really be everywhere, a hypothesis is something that people think might be the case, but they don't actually know, and a theory is something that's actually proven. So when people say it's only a theory, if it's got anything to do with science, a theory is actually fact, because it's been proven. And there are four steps to this. You need to observe the phenomenon, and you need to develop a hypothesis. We test this through experimentation, and then we develop a conclusion. And if we can't, if we can prove the hypothesis, then like it becomes your theory. If you can't prove the hypothesis, then you either need to do better testing, or the hypothesis is actually wrong, which means that whatever you're trying to work out wasn't valid or it didn't exist. So like the the orange is pink. Well, is it or not? You do testing, uh, yeah, and then your conclusion would either show whether or not it is or not. So maybe you do a pink one, maybe you don't. Test and find out. Document it. Um, in science, a single variable was tested to determine if this influences what is observed. Uh, sometimes not all variables can be tested, and sometimes more than one variable is tested, which is poor science. But you'd find, say, as part of troubleshooting, you can't do it quite often. It's not the best to test just one thing at once because you want to give a fast service, but also a quality service to your customer. Um, as, as we've said here, it might be expedient when you're only thinking your solution and do not place much emphasis on the why. Um, also in science, you would use controls. So we know this thing's going to give us a positive result and we know that it's black and we know that's white. So you'd use these things that you know the result and by knowing that a certain test will produce a certain result, you know that your testing procedure is actually a good testing procedure. And then when you get your conclusions and you make a conclusion, You've got to base that on the records of your observations. Um, data is pretty much king, and more data leads to more informed conclusions. Um, I remember the first uh, science experiment I ever did in year seven was on rust. And what we did is we placed nails into a, a cup, left it overnight, came back, and the nails had rusted. And basically the, the answer all the students gave to the science teacher was that the correct answer, but it didn't actually show you, or well, they weren't, the answer wasn't based on the actual observation. So you've got basically conclusions based on what you actually find. Let's see, and I'll mention the little, our four little science steps repeatedly, which will sort of give you the feel that the college assurance is. Uh, not repetitive, but it's basically defined, which leads to your quality of consistent processes and outcomes and, and that. And also when developing a hypothesis, there's this thing called Occam's razor, which is the simple solution is probably the correct one. So you can come up with any number of ideas about something. The more complex they are, the less likely they are to actually be the correct uh, the explanation. So, next slide. Troubleshooting. So, troubleshooting is also known as problem solving. Uh, you tend to do troubleshooting each and every day, just as a matter of course. Uh, there are like structured ways to do it, which is what I'm discussing here. Uh, it's probably process, uh, sorry, problem solving is a process of finding solutions to difficult or complex issues. Uh, troubleshooting is very similar to the scientific method that I have previously discussed. We define the problem, which is pretty much the same as step one of the scientific processes, which was observation. We determine what the cause might be. That's pretty much the same as developing a hypothesis. We test the variables to the problem. You can think of that as conducting experiments. Uh, we determine what the cause of the problem was, uh, which we could also say that's developing a conclusion based on the data. And we implement corrective action 
uh, sorry, we implement corrective and preventable action, so the problem is not likely to happen again. So there's that thing I talked about before, as in I'd rather problem solve something that was not preventable, because otherwise, why did the issue happen? You waste time coming up with solutions to problems that are already known. Uh, one to four is what I do every day. Uh, I like to include number five where possible because it educates the customers on issues and how to fix them and what that results in the long term is people are happy about your product because they know how it works, they know how to troubleshoot things and if they know that problem A is caused by whatever, they can solve it themselves, they don't have to ring us up and get an answer because they already know what the answer is. So happy people, uh, company wise that's good because you're not paying us to solve problems or well, that shouldn't happen. Customers happy because the problem didn't happen or if it did, it's an easy fix. So it's all good. Okay, what is critical thinking? That is the objective analysis and evaluation of an issue in order to form a judgment. Critical thinking go hand, goes hand in hand with problem solving. An issue needs to be evaluated in order to determine how best to solve it. So you wouldn't have a problem and go, hmm, let's just make up some ideas about what the problem might be caused by. You've actually got to look at the problem and figure out the logical reasons why it might happen in order to actually get a solution. Um, with the proliferation of fake news, pseudo or sham, sham science, uh, conspiracy theories and so forth, the ability for anyone to publish anything online, critical thinking and being sceptical is pretty important. Uh, it allows you to determine what is fact and what is fiction. Uh, our whole presentation could be devoted to this subject. Uh, a well-respected physicist and science educator called Sir Carl Sagan wrote a good book on the topic called The Demon Haunted World. I'll discuss a little bit of his um, it's called the Baloney Detection Kit, uh, and a few slides. So basically, you shouldn't believe anything anyone tells you unless it has been shown that such statements are true. So, say after this talk, you want to possibly make sure that the concepts I've delivered to, to, excuse me, delivered to you are actually valid. So I could be making things up. You've got to decide if I'm an expert at the subject or not. Um, if an expert says it, there's a good chance the information is correct. Um, but even experts can get things wrong. Um, and also, like you need to determine if the expert really is an expert, because anyone can say, hey, I'm the best at fishing no, no, diamonds out of a creek. Who knows if you can do that? Are they expert? Has anyone else done it? Um, things like that. Uh, primary or secondary school education is sufficient to give you a pretty good handle on the overall quality of what people say. And on to the next slide. So, what examples of troubleshooting. What I'm going to do here is show you or discuss uh, four scenarios. Generally, the overall process will be the same. There'll be some variations to show you that even though there is a set way of doing things, you can sort of tailor it to what you actually have issue-wise and what, how you want to solve it. So if you've got something you might encounter uh, every day, a light doesn't turn on. You might read something like the news is flat, or oh, sorry, the earth is flat. Um, could that be true? Uh, like I'm, I, I say I'm bad at climbing hills. Like so you, you might want to investigate, is that a true statement? And if it was, how could I improve if I wanted to improve? And we'll go through an example of uh, computer software installation files, uh, which might be relevant to people working at Kaspersky or in any tech support role. Okay, so here's our four sort of quality assurance slash scientific principles. We want to observe what's going on. We want to develop reasons for why it's happening. We want to test those reasons and see if they're actually correct. And then we want to develop a conclusion. And once we have our conclusion, that's when you can then develop like a set method for going through the things and say, hey, this is what happens, this is what causes it, here's our solution, here's what we'll do if it happens again. And I'll summarise up how critical thinking helps at the end of each little um, example. So we've got a light doesn't turn on. So what are our observations? Here yeah, I've got ten or nine of them. Flick the switch. There's no light. Okay. 
What's the next observation? Well, the light worked yesterday. Okay, so what's going on here? Let's flip the switch on and off a little few more times. Still no light, so that sort of reproduces step one and also shows us that the light's definitely not going to turn on. We have a look at the globe. Yeah, it's definitely there, okay. Uh, say this happens at night. We can look across the street. The street lights are in other houses. Other lights on there. In this case, they are. Uh, okay. What can we check in the house to see if it's just that one light that's got a problem? Maybe we're in the dark at the moment. So we look at the fridge. The fridge light comes on. Okay. Must have power in the house. Just to be doubly sure and say reproduce step six. We look at our power meter. The power spinning around. Okay. Something weird and magical is not actually happening with the fridge, and it is actually powered by the power supply. Um, there's no fuses blown when we have a look at the fuse blocks, which we've done while we look at our power meter. Okay, so um, other lights turn on when their switches are flicked. So, what do all our observations potentially tell us about why the globe isn't turning on? So, so here we would develop our little hypothesis. So I've put down five. They range from probably feasible to possibly not feasible. So we've got a blown globe. We've got a loose connection to the light socket. Maybe there's a loose connection to the switch. And maybe mice have eaten through the cable. And then when we get a bit far-fetched in our hypotheses, which you find people do occasionally, like aliens that replace a globe with a fake globe. So going by Occam's razor, we want to test the most likely solution before we get on to ones that are complex and least likely, which saves time and is sort of the, the logical thing to do. And when you're looking at hypotheses, you want them to be testable and also falsifiable. So we can test for a blown globe, we can test for loose connections at a light socket and at the light switch. We could possibly test that the mouse is eaten for a cable, but with our skills, maybe we're not an electrician and maybe we don't want to pull plaster off the wall or check out the cables. So in this case, that wouldn't be a testable hypothesis. So science-wise, that would be invalid, so we wouldn't even bother testing. Um, number five, like that's with the hypothesis, you want them to be falsifiable. That one, you can't falsify it because there's really no way to get the data. Um, like, who knows, it might possibly be the case because who knows the capabilities of aliens assume they even exist, but because you can't falsify it, there's not a valid hypothesis, so you strike that from the list, so we've only got like three things to test. So, here's where we start our experimentation. Blown globe, we look at the globe, see if it's burnt out. If it is, we replace the globe and we test the switch. So if you've solved the problem then, the globe goes on. Possibly the globe still doesn't go on, so maybe it's all this connection of the light socket. So we could wiggle the globe when the switch is in the on position, remove the globe and reseat it, test the switch, maybe the light goes on then. If it does, then you'd show that, okay, even though we replaced the original globe, it still didn't work, we wiggled things around. Now it did work. So we could put the new globe back in its box and use the old globe because we've shown that there was just at least globe in the socket. Uh, we've got a loose connection to the light switch. We could possibly test that. Uh, would we want to because we don't want to be playing around for electricity if we're not, not an electrician. And then the last two examples of what, like what I talked about before. One, we could possibly test it but we can't using our skills or our available resources. So we strike that from the list. And the other one's not falsifiable in principle. In principle, it's really fast fetched so that's not really a valid hypothesis. And it's not worth your time testing things that aren't likely to be the case. So if we tested the blown globe and found that your globe was blown, that would be supported by Occam's razor because it's the simplest uh, reason for the problem. So based on all our experimentations here and our observations here, we get to our conclusion. And based on that conclusion, the results must be supported. So light goes on or not. Did we solve the problem? In this case, we did. Um, which was, did I state it? Don't think I did. Hmm. 
basically was quite as quite as blame. So as critical thinking help. By observing the problem, we can save time by not testing invalid hypotheses. Um, no blown fuses means we don't need to replace the fuses by testing simple hypothesis first, such as blown globe. We may have seen that the filament in the globe is broken, so what you have to do is replace the globe. So to save time, you get the solution straight away. Um, if the blown globe is replaced and the light is still off, then there's the other hypotheses we can go through in testing. So basically, if you test the simplest thing first, there's no need to go through the more complex solutions or ideas if you found the solution already. Um, and I guess in a, in a say the word place solution, if you document the process, then you've got a set troubleshooting process in the future with steps you can follow, which means that if someone, say if you work in a lighting store and they said, someone comes in, hey, my globe doesn't work. You go, okay, here's how you troubleshoot blown globes. You don't have to go through the process of developing uh, a solution to the problem because it's your main problem because you've already determined what the problem was or all the possible problems and you developed documentation on how to troubleshoot it. So it's sort of win-win. So our next thing we can look at is whether or not the Earth is flat, which might be obvious to some, might not. Okay, so we've got our four scientific principles again. We want to observe the phenomenon. We want to develop a hypothesis. We want to test for experimentation. And we want to develop a conclusion. So here we see round Earth and a potential version of flat Earth. So what are our observations? Well, looking at the horizon, it certainly does look flat, which would suggest the Earth is flat. Um, I can only see a limited distance and I can see further when I am up high. I can also see more of a distant object, say the feet of a statue that's a kilometre away. That would tend to suggest that the Earth is round. Time zones and sunrise slash sunset are different across the planet. Um, based on the function of light, that may or may not be flat or round Earth. The same goes for uh, observation four. You've got a stick in Perth, you've got a stick in Melbourne, which they're a fair way apart. Um, the same time of day, as in the same actual time, not time zone time, the both sticks have different heights, which would suggest round Earth if light has a certain property, which I'll discuss. Um, objects on the horizon appear to rise, not just appear, that would suggest around Earth. Star constellations are different depending on where I'm located globally, depending on how far away the stars are. That could maybe be flat Earth and maybe could be round Earth. Um, photos from space indicate Earth is round and it appears to spin, so that would support the Earth is round. So based on our observations, we've got two hypotheses, one the Earth is flat and one the Earth is round. So we can test this fairly simply. Um, getting on to things like statements that people might consider to be pretty strange or out there, you've got to consider a few other things like how reliable is the source and does the claim and have an agenda. So it's probably important when it comes to politics because most politicians might have an agenda, so they might say certain things aren't correct, but like is what they when they say something isn't wrong, is that sorry, if they say something is incorrect, does that actually mean it's incorrect? You've got to actually consider who's making the statement. Is there independent confirmation of the facts? So has more than one person confirmed that what the facts are is actually the facts? Or have people disproven? Um, has anyone tried to disprove the, the facts of the statement? Can the hypothesis be disproved? So there's a, an agency and can it be falsified? And also can it be tested? So if you can't disprove something, well, that means that like, what is the absence of evidence doesn't mean evidence. And, um, can it also be tested? If, if you can't test something, it's much the same as you can't disprove it. It's like not really valid. You can make up any facts, but if you can't prove that facts are pr true, then you can't prove it. Um, and does the idea account for unknowns in the current theory? So if someone comes up for a new idea for something, like, does it take into 
all the current neurology on the old theory and account for things that aren't known. Because if it, if it doesn't take into account everything that actually is known, then quite likely that it's actually going to be a bit easy. Um, the internet's full of crazy ideas. Um, so how we to support the facts and the fiction, like with this flat Earth example. There's other theories that say, I'm oh sorry, other hypotheses that say the world is indeed round, but actually hollow, and it's inhabited by a superior race or something like that. So it's like, is it flat? Is it round? Is it hollow? Who knows? Experiment, find out. Um, yeah, so next slide. So we test through experimentation. So here, what we could do is we could look as far away as we can with binoculars or a telescope while on the ground at distant objects and then climb a hill or a tree or a building or whatever and look in the same direction and then observe and record the differences. We could stick nails in, say, a melon at certain distances apart and then shine a torch on that melon and see if the shadows are at different lengths. Uh, we could also rotate the nails in that melon and see what happens. Do the nails just fade away? Or would they fade away if this is a really huge melon and the atmosphere is fuzzy? Or do they sort of go below the horizon or rise to the horizon? And we could bang nails in a flat piece of wood and observe the shadow length under the sun. Are the shadow lengths the same or not? Um, using the setup from four, we could bring the nails, or bring the wood to eye level and see what happens to the nails. Do they disappear at distances further away? Like, what happens? Um, we could lower the piece of wood and determine what happens if the nails you might want to see more compared to when the wood's right up at eye level. Um, what would happen if we actually bend the wood, wood nails fade away in the in the distance or would they drop below the, the horizon with dread? So basically, in this case, like these experiments, I'm not going to go through them specifically, but like if you all got together and you conducted all these experiments yourselves and then got together and discussed the results, then you could develop a conclusion, which is what happens in science. And lots of people will do the same experiment. You can pair notes, see if what you produced is the same as what someone else produced. And if you can get consistent reproducible results, then those results and your observations are very likely to actually show you what reality is like. I will discuss this in little diagrams. So what we have here is we've got round earth and we've got flat earth and here we're going to assume that previous uh, experiments on light are actually correct. So we can, people have shown that the sun's pretty big and it's a long long way away which means essentially that when the sun's rays get to us they are parallel. So here we can see shadows on round earth on the same size object sticking up perpendicular like a 9 degree angle from the ground at the same time of, not the same time I guess like I should say, shadow lengths differ based on the curved surface. So you can see the top shadow or the top stick, the shadow is long but the, the other shadow which is supposed to represent midday, you've got no shadow in the stick. So that would indicate that the Earth's round. Whereas you look at the, the flat Earth, it uh, doesn't matter how far apart the, uh, the sticks were, or buildings, statues, or whatever, within like reason. Human, they weren't like billions of kilometres apart based on the, the, the sun. The shadow lengths are all the same. So that would indicate that the, the first hypothesis we have is in the Earth's round. That's the correct one. And here we have flat world and round world again, and we'll discuss like our sight lines. So we've got one guy here at the top on flat world. He's looking, say, 2,000 k's away at a tree. The tree would be pretty small, but he should be able to see all the tree, notwithstanding buildings and hills or whatever getting in the way. Whereas on round world, if the tree was 2,000 kilometres away and you had this enough curvature in the, the object occur, of course. You can't see the tree because it's below the horizon. Uh, talking about our little 
nail and melon rotation experiment. Uh, the top sort of green free lines are supposed to show you what would happen if you were looking at, say, a ship sailing on a way rather than dip below the horizon like what you would see. It would just get smaller and smaller and probably fuzzier as it's more and more atmosphere in the way. Whereas on the round world, as a ship sailed below the horizon, it's pretty much like what you would see. You'd see it sink below the horizon because the sight line's getting occluded by the, the, the ground. So, how would critical helping critical thinking help us here? By developing our own experiments or using current knowledge of others, you can determine the validity of others' ideas. So here we tested two hypotheses. We didn't make any uh, assumptions about what was correct. Uh, it's another important thing about science. You, you make some assumptions based on what's already been discovered, as in our, our sun rays, but you don't make assumptions about, say, what you're actually testing. So we tested the hypothesis that Earth was flat and the Earth was round, uh, based on the little diagrams. It looks pretty much like the Earth is round. Uh, plus, when you expand things out, it doesn't really make sense yet. Like, because there's no evidence of people sailing off the edge of the Earth. Satellites orbit the Earth, and they magically go poof at one end of the orbit, and then poof back at the um, the other side of the flat Earth. Uh, the Moon looks like it's round. Uh, you could do another experiment with, say, the basketball on the torch and look at uh, phases of the Moon and how shadows form and everything and then apply that to the Earth and go, mm, yes, it looks like it's round. Um, photos from high altitude in space show curvature, which also suggests the Earth's round. Um, one interesting thing here is gravity. Gravity pulls down to the centre of mass. So if we're on the flat Earth and you're on the edge of the flat Earth, you'd be getting pulled sideways because most of the mass is towards the centre of the, the um, flat land, not down. Um, the same would go if the uh, Earth was this weird thing where you've got like four elephants sitting on top of a turtle. Gravity would still tend to pull down and towards the centre of the mass, which would be under the centre of the flat Earth, making some assumptions about how big the elephant the turtles are and everything. But there'd be really wacky gravity. It wouldn't be everywhere on Earth, everything pulls straight down. There'd be, depending on where you are, gravity could be sideways or it could be down or it could be to an angle. So all this suggests the Earth's round. Uh, okay, so when we're talking about crazy or potentially crazy facts, you got to look at how reliable is the source. Does the claimant have an agenda? Uh, in this case, we don't know. Is there independent confirmation of the facts? Uh, in this case, well, I'd pretty much say no. Has the hypothesis been disproved or falsified? Well, we'd say yes, because you just get it. Has anyone tried to disprove it? Yep, as in I just did, hopefully. Can it be tested? Yes, because I have, and I've given extra examples about how it can be tested. Uh, does the idea account for un the unknowns in the current theory? Uh, no, the, the round earth hypothesis, I'm pretty sure, came along after the flat earth hypothesis. Um, that's something I actually check if I wanted to. Uh, and round earth matches the data that we observe. So in this case, we go, yes, the earth is round. So our next example is, I'm bad at climbing hills. So here we show our four scientific principles again to show that a consistent approach is the best way to do troubleshooting. So we want to observe the phenomenon, we want to develop hypothesis, we want to test things, and we want to develop a conclusion. Uh, you find this example will be a little bit different because we're not actually trouble shooting, we're sort of implementing action to solve a problem. So what do I observe? Well, when climbing up hills, I tend to be slower than others. It's always fun when you're climbing up a hill and uh, people are right away from you. When I'm way more, I climb slower. Okay, what does that mean? Let's find out. I also climb faster when I'm on a light bike. Okay, and that relates a fair bit to weighing more slash weighing less. When I'm racing well, I seem to climb better. Okay, what, what does racing well mean? Um, sometimes observations don't contain hard data, like this racing well, and I'm bad, and maybe I tend to be slower. Um, 
So we could change this and rather than saying I'm bad at climbing hills, we could turn it into I'm slow in climbing hills and I want it to be faster. So that way, it's rather than just saying that we might do anything with, like I'm bad at climbing hills, yeah, okay, so what? I want to actually turn that into a problem and fix it. So now I'm slow at climbing hills and I want to be faster. So we want to observe what's going on here. So when I'm climbing up Mount Payne, I'm often a minute slower than others. When I weigh 90 kilograms, I climb slower than when I weigh 80, and maybe it feels a bit harder as well. Uh, I climb faster when I'm on a light bike for the same measured effort. Um, cycling in most sports these days is great. You've got all these electronic devices that capture lots and lots of data, and you can use that data to get better. Um, I cycle at Mount Payne 45 seconds faster at 300 watts and 250 watts. So data's king here. Uh, what are we going to do with it? We want to use it somehow. So, based on the observations, we have some hypotheses. So, my weight affects my climbing speed, and my power output determines climbing speed. So, a little research here shows that these aren't actually hypotheses, they're theories, because previous studies and other people have actually determined these things actually be fact. So, there's a thing called a power to weight ratio. So, the better your power to weight ratio, the better you can climb hills. Um, so what do I want to do in this case? Do I want to improve my climbing speed? Yes, I do. So what do I want to do? Do I want to increase power or do I want to increase decrease weight? Um, what's the easiest thing to do? Uh, as a cyclist, less weight equals less power. So I need to get up a slope. Uh, less weight might also mean less effort. Uh, less weight could also mean less power because I've got smaller muscles. So ideally you want to sort of do things so you don't lose too much power if you are losing power. Uh, ideally, just less weight, faster hill climbing speed. You're all good. It's also why you see like skinny cyclists running up mountains faster than larger cyclists normally because they only have to put out say 100 watts versus 200 watts for the hill climbing because they weigh less. So as we have the theory, we want to implement corrective action in this case because we've rephrased it to be the actual problem. So say I weigh 80 kilograms now, I want to test things at 250 watts. So climbing up Mount Payne, it takes me five minutes on a calm sunny day. And I record this in my little log so I can refer to back to, back to it when I'm 75 kilograms, which is what we've decided to do here. It's easy to say, not eat, or eat less, lose some weight, do some testing. That way we keep the wattage consistent. The variable here is the weight. So some months go by, I now weigh 75 kilograms. I climb the hill at 250 watts. It gets me up there for minutes 30 seconds. Looking at my previous records, I've shown that there was the same weather conditions. So it was a calm, sunny day. So there's no variables in there like wind speed or big potholes or dead rabbits I've got to ride over. So there's nothing slowing me down or speeding me up. The only thing that's changing change is the weight I am. Um, and we consume, I've concentrated on my hill climbing. My power reports hopefully increased, which would be an advantage in a race, but it's not something we've actually tested. So we can't make any conclusions about that little section of the thing. And like as a cyclist, I'm always trying to lose the extra five kilograms and get the 75 kilograms. I'm always sticking around 80, doesn't matter what I do, 80, 80, because it's like, hey, you block a shot, nom, 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 nom. Okay, so conclusion wise, did I lose weight? Yes, I did lose weight. I lost five kilograms. Did I get stronger? I didn't test it. How long does it take us to climb a hill at 75 kilograms versus 80? Well, it took me five minutes at 80, it took us four and a half at 75, so that's 30 seconds less. So to make a conclusion, it would be at 250 watts, Mount Payne can be climbed at 75 kilograms, 30 seconds faster than if I weighed at 80. So it was the corrective action we implemented in place, which was lose weight. Was that successful? Yes, because now I'm climbing much faster. Um, things like uh, showing actions that have been put in place that actually have an effect is important uh, in lots of situations. Uh, he demonstrated when running a project that your goals are met, uh, and there's uh, smart goals which are what specific, measurable, achievable, uh, something rather untestable. I knew what it was 20 minutes ago, but anyway, you want to show that 
if you put in corrective action, ideally you get a positive result and the action actually works because you don't want to continually be doing the same thing over and over again if it doesn't give you the result you achieve because you're wasting time, potentially you're wasting money and it doesn't give you the result you want. And because you've recorded all these and you followed a set procedure, you can determine by examining your documentation where you're from and then you can improve the process which leads to uh, more consistent outcomes in the future. Uh, and critical thinking helped because it enabled us to rephrase or redefine the problem. So we turned a, just a statement into a problem. We can let's examine what was going on, let's uh, develop some way to fix it uh, by developing measurable actions and getting an outcome. Um, yeah, and showing positive outcomes is important when it comes to things like, uh, say, website click through, click through rates and returns on investment and determining success of training. Uh, negative outcome would show you that the, the solution we put in place wasn't any good, which means that we need to change things. Um, say if I was a coach here, I could show how my training plans worked. I could also improve upon them over time and then improve my services, which is great in the business because improved services means better service, obviously, but also if you give people better service, speedier than normal, then save time, time is money, company goes yay, or whoever runs the company goes yay. Okay, so our last example, we've got 10 minutes ago, so we'll get through this, no worries, is a computer software installation failed. So, to show we're being consistent in our approach, I've listed the four little methods again, not steps. We want to observe what's going on. We want to develop ideas about why what's going on is going on. We want to then test our ideas about what's going wrong. And then we want to develop a conclusion. And in troubleshooting, having the conclusion allows you to provide the solution. So normally when a program fails to install, there is an error message. So what exactly is the error or the problem? Quite often people ring up and go, my Kaspersky isn't working. It's like, okay, then we have to elicit the information from them to determine actually what is the problem. There's no point going, okay, your computer's not working because of blah, you've actually got to know what blah is. So we gather information to eliminate the variables, so is the software supported on the operating system, have prerequisites been met, can we reproduce the issue, can a hypothesis of the root cause be formulated, um, and does a fix based on the observations hypothesis fix the problem. Uh, quite often, or all the time, we find that it comes down to three things when we develop our hypothesis and do our observations. Software it doesn't install because it's a known issue, something hasn't been done correctly, or it's something new. That's pretty much it. Um, ideally, we test the most likely hypothesis first and say, okay, so it's a known issue, here's the answer to it. Something isn't been, so we assume we're doing things correctly, of course. Um, if then we find out that that doesn't fix things, maybe they're not doing something correctly, so we look at that, and if all else fails, there must be something new. Hey, something new, that makes things interesting. It's just something we do and then develop and turn that into a solution, which means that next time something new happens, we actually can say, hey, here's the answer. So testing through experimentation. So if it's a known issue, we give standard fix. Uh, get it work, okay, no, we get a Number two, which is something isn't being done correctly. So have the prerequisites been met? Um, has the correct procedure been followed? If yes, we follow them. Did it fix the issue? Good. Yes. Yay. If no, then that's when we go to step three, which is something new. So we try to determine what the cause of the issue is. So we get data. We attempt to reproduce the problem. And Maybe doing that we determine it is a known issue or they haven't done something correctly or we do find out it's something brand new um, and then we develop a solution from there. Uh, this text you could also whack it into a flowchart which we'll see in the next slide. So pretty much exactly the same procedure here. We've got a problem. Do we know the issue? Okay. Or, sorry, is it a known issue? Yes. Okay. What do we do? We provide the standard fix. Did it work? Yes. Okay. Good. We're done. Coffee time. Uh, when we provide the standard fix, did it work? No. Okay. We go on to have the prerequisites be, so it's been met. Slash. So we could go straight to that from the start if we wanted to in this uh, little flowchart design. Um, have that been met? Yes. Okay. 
if they have been met, you go straight to, okay, it must be something new, let's just do some testing. If they hadn't been met, then what you want to do is actually follow the standard procedure and meet your prerequisites. So there's no, no point trying to install a program on the Windows XP when it's only going to work on Windows 10. Uh, did the problem go away when everything was done correctly? Yes, okay, done, cool, grab yourself another coffee. Uh, did the problem go away? No, okay, must be something new, then we go into testing it. So it's basically you follow your little established troubleshooting procedures, they all lead to a certain uh, outcome. Ideally, there's something known, but if not, you've got a procedure to follow to actually troubleshoot what's going on to fix it. So from all that, you develop a conclusion and then update a troubleshooting guide. So I like my troubleshooting guide to be an index database that's pretty much like Evernote or OneDrive. Uh, that way I can reference solutions to known issues. So if someone says, hey, security center database update, I go to the appropriate little index and go, ha ha, here's your solution if you based on the known problem. Um, we supplement that with various resources such as our online help, admin guides, and internal help systems. So here you can see a little example of my indexing and answers. Uh, we've got our OneNote uh, solutions as well, and we've got our Kaspersky Confluence in the background. And also look at like support.kaspersky.com. Support uh, all that boils down to providing uh, like quick solutions to most of the issues that arise, which uh, is good because people don't like being left waiting. And also means you're not scratching your head going, hmm, what could be causing this problem? No, most problems are due to known causes. Uh, so yeah, using critical thinking speeds up providing a solution to known issues and allows new issues to be problem solved in a consistent manner and enables efficiency, which is all what you want. Um, if the same issue is unknown today and a solution is developed next time, it's a known solution, so a solution can be provided immediately, which uh, leads to a consistent service and a speed service. So conclusion-wise, quality assurance allows for a consistent methodology for problem solving. The scientific principles help troubleshooting by breaking down the analysis process combine those and you get an efficient and consistent troubleshooting methodology. Critical thinking allows you to make the best decisions while problem solving and critical thinking examines facts as well as the data you produce. And hopefully you've seen how scientific thinking and following like set procedure for troubleshooting can actually benefit you. So if you've got any problems, take them away and follow these, this step and hopefully you get a solution. And that is that. So, thank you for attending. Uh, this is being recorded as far as I know, so you can play it back uh, later at your leisure. Um, I did have a little section here for questions, but soon we just chat. Um, if you want to find me on email, uh, just send me a uh, question or two and hopefully I can give you some answers. So, Thanks for coming and have a good evening slash morning.